turns out that Asteroid Day has been celebrated since 2014, uh, when it was proposed by an amazingly talented group of people uh, that included Stephen Hawking, uh, Apollo astronaut Rusty Swikert, and the Queen guitarist uh, Brian May. Asteroid Day was officially recognized by the UN in 2016 and is held on the anniversary of the Tunguska event, where an air burst, an air burst uh, from an extraterrestrial object flattened 80 million trees over an area of 2,100 square kilometers in eastern Siberia on this day in 1908. Uh, the image of terror raining from the sky as asteroids collide with Earth uh, is the fodder of several disaster films that are seemingly played daily on TV. Uh, and I know this because I have a bad habit of watching them over and over again. Tonight's lecture, however, will highlight a more uh, benevolent aspect of asteroids. They are the primary carriers of information about the processes that were happening when the planets in our solar system were just beginning to form. For planets the size of Earth, uh, the continuing geologic activities erased or at least severely overprinted most of this formative record from its history. Asteroids, however, quenched and preserved these steps in planet formation. So if you wanna know what processes determine the composition of a planet, and for example, whether or not it contained water or, or a variety of chemicals needed to foster the development of life, uh, asteroids are the place to look. Tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Larry Nittler, first came to Carnegie in 1996 after completing his PhD in physics at Washington University in St. Louis, which is one of the world's leading universities in the field of cosmic chemistry. He then took a position at NASA Goddard for a couple of years before returning to Carnegie. While at Goddard, uh, he participated in his first spacecraft mission, the Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous mission, that was the first of uh, NASA's Discovery class missions and also the first spacecraft to orbit an asteroid. Larry led the data, data analysis of the X-ray spectrometer uh, on the spacecraft that provided compositional information about the surface of the Eros asteroid. Since then, uh, Larry has served various roles in seven additional missions, including as de deputy principal investigator on the messenger mission uh, to Mercury. Uh, that was under pr principal investigator Sean Solomon, uh, who was one of my predecessors as director of uh, the Earth and Planets Lab. Larry is one of only nine Americans selected as a participating scientist in the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission uh, that returned samples of the Ryugu asteroid uh, to Earth just this past uh, winter. Larry's combination of microanalytical expertise and planetary scale investigations is nearly unique in the field of planetary science and cosmic chemistry. And it makes it possible for him to devise some truly unique job descriptions for his work. <laughs> Examples include Hermiochemist uh, for his work on the composition of mercury and interstellar dustbuster for his work on pre-solar grains that are contained in some primitive meteorites. The breadth of his expertise and the diversity of approaches uh, gives him a remarkable insight into how information collected from asteroids can address major questions about how our planet and our solar system came to be. During lesson, Larry's presentation, uh, we welcome your questions. Please type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and Larry will address these uh, questions at the end of his talk. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Larry, who will be presenting his lecture, Bringing Asteroids to Earth, a trip to the early solar system. All yours, Larry. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, thanks for that introduction and for providing some of the background information that I'm going to repeat about why asteroids are really important. It's a, a, a real pleasure to be speaking to you all. Uh, these neighborhood lectures used to be to bring our science to our neighbors, or physical neighbors to our campus. And one good aspect of the last year might be that we can now bring these lectures to a much broader number of neighbors and friends around the world. And I'm happy to be part of this. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about asteroids, and I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, okay. Unless I can't click. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to start at the very beginning. In 1801, uh, a Catholic priest and astronomer named Giuseppe Piazzi, working in Palermo, was looking for a star another astronomer had reported and discovered a new planet or a new planetary body orbiting between Mars and Jupiter. And he gave it this name, Sorera Ferdinandea. My apologies that my Italian is bad. Um, and with this fanciful image on the cover of his report of this, uh, the astronomical community soon shortened that to Ceres, named after the god, and uh, was the first new planet in a while, but it was followed up very soon thereafter by the discovery of another planet between Mars and Jupiter named Pallas, and then Juno, and then Vesta, and so on. So it was very quickly uh, clear uh, to the astronomical community that there was a new class of small planetary bodies orbiting the sun between Mars and Jupiter. 
Sir William Herschel at a Royal Society meeting in 1802 suggested that these be called asteroids from the Greek for star-like or star-shaped, and that name actually stuck, and we still use it today. Uh, discoveries continued apace. There were maybe 50 by the middle of the 19th century, more than 100 known by the end of the 19th century, and the current number is a little bit over a million. And uh, of course, it's gotten much, much higher in the last decades because there have been automated surveys looking for them because there's great interest in understanding uh, where potentially hazardous bodies are that could come hit us and be much worse than the Tunguska event that uh, Rick mentioned or the event that wiped out the dinosaurs. I'm not gonna be talking about uh, hazards because there's other reasons to care about asteroids. Um, and so why should we care? And to answer this question, I'm gonna, let's think about the solar system. This is a, you know, a cartoon of the solar system today. You have a sun and you have uh, eight major planets around it. And then a whole lot, I just said, a million asteroids, probably millions of small bodies of, uh, in the outer solar system, many, many, many moons and small bodies. Um, today, but how did it get here? How did we get to this state uh, today? And to answer that, we need to go back in time. And this is uh, uh, four and a half, just over four and a half billion years ago, the atoms that are now in the solar system were in a cloud like this. And this is a giant molecular cloud called the Eagle Nebula. And this is the birthplace of stars. It's a giant cloud of gas and dust in between the stars. And um, if we zoom in a little bit into this cloud, there's this extremely famous Hubble Space Telescope image called the Pillars of Creation. And you look there, that's where there's concentrated material collapsing, and you have these little filaments here and there, and the ends of those is where new stars are forming as this gas collapses under its own weight. And what happens when the gas collapses under its own weight is that due to the laws of physics, it doesn't just fall and become a star, it becomes a pancake-shaped disk of gas and dust with a forming star at the middle, what we call the protoplanetary disk or the solar nebula. And this is an artist's conception of what such a disk looks like, but we know these exist because we can see them. We know that planets are born in these disks of gas and dust. And um, these are some old images of, of uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope of disks in the Orion Nebula. So these are very, very young forming stars. And you see these, these black halos around them. That's, that's a disk of gas and dust that's blocking the light from coming behind. These ones over here are seen edge on and you can't even see, or you can only barely see the light of the star in the middle. There's so the disk is blocking it all out. Now, in the last few years, we're starting to get spectacular images like this one down here. This is a protoplanetary disk image taken with the ALMA Observatory, which is a um, a big array of radio dishes in Chile and just producing spectacularly awesome science and images. And this is a, a, a forming planetary system and where you have these black uh, gaps in the disk, these rings, is where we think there are new planets forming and pulling in material from the disk. So we have direct observational evidence that these things form in disks. And the way we think this happens is through a process called accretion. And I will say at the beginning, there are huge numbers of parts of this process we do not understand and that there's puzzles and there's progress and then regress and so on but the basic idea is sound and the basic idea is that the as the disk gas cools it uh, the atoms stick together and form dust particles those dust particles collide and stick together to form larger dust particles and then pebbles and then rocks and eventually these rocks all come together to form bodies of the kilometer or tens of kilometer scale sometimes called planetesimals. And it's these that tend to collide uh, and combine to form the final stages of planet formation. If they're big enough, if they form big enough, their gravity can pull in a whole lot of hydrogen and helium from the, the nebula itself and become things like Jupiter, gas giants. And if not, they stay behind as, as small rocky planets like we have in the inner solar system. And through this process, we go from this disk to planets. And a little cartoon of our solar system here, the key thing again is between Mars and Jupiter, many of these planetesimals survive today. That they, they never got for, got pulled into one of these planets. And so they're really leftovers of planet formation. They're, they're, uh, they're things that never made it into a planet and didn't get thrown out of the system. A lot of the ones that were there were ejected in interstellar space. Um, and of course, there's also things in the outer solar system that are more icy, but I'm talking about asteroids here. So asteroids, as Rick was saying in his introduction, are extremely important uh, as uh, uh, probes of the early solar system because they formed in the disk very early on and very little has happened to them since. 
they preserve this fossil record of the conditions in the disk, a, a chemical and isotopic and physical record of, of how the planets formed, what they were made out of originally and how the processes happened in, throughout the solar system. And as Rick also alluded to, they also, many of them are known to contain large amounts of water and interesting uh, organic molecules. So these bodies may have been important contributors to the to the seed ingredients for the eventual emergence of life on Earth. So they're of great scientific interest and they've been studied for a long time. And how do we study asteroids? Well, traditionally, of course, they're studied the way every object in space is studied by looking at them and using optics to make them brighter and closer uh, with telescopes. And so this image on the right shows an image of the asteroid Vesta taken 14 years ago with the Hubble Space Telescope. But of course, asteroid observations go all the way back to 1801. And one of the important things uh, or most common tools used in studying asteroids and where we get much of the much of the information we have is by looking at their spectra. And this this plot on the right is basically showing how much sunlight is reflected off of these bodies as a function of wavelength. And this is mostly in the infrared. So these are light, this is light we can't see with our naked eyes. The visible spectrum is just at the very left here. But what you can see is, for example, the asteroid Vesta that I just showed you that picture. When you look at its spectrum, first of all, you see it's fairly bright. About half the sunlight comes back to the, the, the telescope. But uh, there are also these deep features here and these mean that there are certain minerals there that absorb light at that frequency but not at this frequency so this is diagnostic of particular minerals and the fact that these different types of asteroids have different spectra means they're probably composed of different materials so there i said different flavors there are different families or types of uh, asteroids and on the right shows their distribution in the solar system and this is a plot of the number of these things versus for each group versus the distance from the sun. And the, um, the units here are astronomical units. AU is, is, uh, is, is the average distance between the Earth and the sun. So the Earth is at one, Mars is at one and a half over here at this end, Jupiter's at five. So again, most of them are in the asteroid belt. And you can see they're not uniformly distributed, that you have the C types and D types farther out from the sun than the E types and the S types and so on. So this tells us something about the early stages of planet formation and how these planetesimals formed and what happened to them during planet formation. And there's a lot of research into this, using these distributions to better understand how the planets came together. Another way we can study asteroids is by visiting them with spacecraft. And Galileo was the first uh, mission to do so. This was a Jupiter probe in the early 90s, but on its way, it uh, stopped by an asteroid called Ida. Well, it didn't stop, but it flew by and took pictures and made the uh, wonderful discovery that Ida had a tiny moon named Dactyl. And it, we now know that many asteroids have are multiple bodies and either have moons or are similar size orbiting each other. And uh, I, just, I just love this image. I love the idea of standing on an asteroid and looking at the little tiny asteroid moon. Uh, but after this, uh, Rick also mentioned Near was the first asteroid or the first space mission to really target an asteroid, and it um, it flew by an asteroid called Matilda and took pictures. But then it spent a whole year orbiting Eros, which is an S-class asteroid, which is uh, the most common type of asteroid in the inner soul, inner asteroid belt, and uh, doing all kinds of measurements. And I'll talk br very briefly about this later. But so we know a great deal. This was the first asteroid we really explored in depth, up close and personal. Uh, more recently, the Dawn mission, another NASA discovery mission, spent a year orbiting Vesta and then three years orbiting Ceres, two of the largest asteroids. And Vesta is a differentiated asteroid. That means it at some point melted and differentiated into a core and a mantle and has basically volcanic rocks at its surface, whereas Ceres is large but didn't melt that way, but it had a lot of water that melted and, and altered things. And it's, again, very, very interesting object. Um, Psyche is a NASA discovery mission that is uh, being built right now and is going to be launched in a year or two, and it's going to go to an asteroid of the same name called Psyche, um, uh, uh, which is thought to be an iron asteroid. And this, this mission is led by uh, uh, Lindy Elkenstanton at Arizona State, who is a uh, former uh, director of the Earth and Planets Laboratory. Another way we can study asteroids is not so obvious because we're not studying them directly, but studying things that come from them, and that is studying meteorites. And I have devoted a great deal of my career to meteorites. I love meteorites. They are rocks that fall from outer space, and that is cool. Uh, this is a um, woodcut here on the left of a very famous meteorite fall in France in the late 1400s, Ensensheim. 
Uh, and then a fanciful image of the Weston, Connecticut uh, fall from December 1807. This one turned out to be extremely important, that it fell in New England at a, uh, um, and uh, was observed by Yale scientists and things and started to really lead to the acceptance that the uh, that meteorites really were rocks from outer space. Before this, a lot of scientists either discounted their existence or thought they were some sort of atmospheric phenomenon, the lightning interacting with clouds and making rocks. But starting pretty much with Weston and a few others around the same time, scientists really started to accept they came from outer space. Where do the where do we find meteorites? Well, we find we find them all over. Uh, they, well, they fall all over the Earth. Of course, we don't find them at the bottom of the ocean, though we could in principle. Uh, but it turns out deserts are uh, really the best place to find them, um, other than having one, you know, luckily fall near you where you can see where it falls and pick it up right away. Uh, uh, but deserts are really, really uh, excellent places because they're very dry, which means meteorites can fall and last for a very long time before they get destroyed. If a, if a meteorite falls around where I am right now in Washington, D.C., Within a few years, the wa if you don't find it right away, within a few years, it'll interact with the water and the rain and, and wild weather away. And Antarctica turns out to be a really great place to find meteorites. And that's a picture of me about 20 years ago collecting a meteorite in Antarctica. Various nations send teams fairly regularly. Uh, the US does almost every year, well, every year until COVID hit, uh, to, to Antarctica to search for meteorites on ice fields near the edge of the continent. And they've now found tens of thousands of meteorites there. But they're not all, you don't have to go to deserts. This picture on the bottom left is a picture that came out a few months ago, a very famous meteorite fall in the United Kingdom in February of this year, fell in the village of Winchcombe. And part of it fell on somebody's driveway and disintegrated into just this gray powder. And so that's, uh, uh, they did get very nice stones that fell on softer ground and survive. And it's a very interesting meteorite. And I can't wait till someday when I can get a, a look at it myself, but it's um, all the meteoriticists and, Britain are hard at work or in the UK are hard at work studying it. So if you're lucky, you catch them when they fall. If not, you can go find them in places where it's amenable. But where are they from? And why do we say they're tied to asteroids? And the reason we know they come from asteroids comes from movies like this. This is the fireball of a meteorite called Peekskill that landed in October 9th, on October 9th, 1992. And the fun thing about this one is that it is a, uh, um, uh, it was a Friday night in the United States in the fall, which is when high school football games are going on. And so there were lots of people watching football games with their, their video cameras filming the game. And so they saw this fireball and also filmed the fireball. So there was a lot of footage of the, the fireball and we were able to rebuild the trajectory and figure out where it came from. Uh, it, this shows that it landed in Peekskill and uh, destroyed the uh, a, woman's car she later sold the car and the meteorite to a dealer for like thirty thousand dollars which made her very happy because i think the car was worth a few hundred bucks um but of course the meteorite is really exciting and scientifically important because of the fireball it's not actually on this plot but several are so you can do this there are now networks set up to track these and do a better job if you get enough footage from different angles you can reconstruct it and when this has been done uh, every single one of them clearly came from the asteroid belt. So it's basically just backing out from the or trajectory as it comes into the atmosphere, backing out where it came from. And so we know that they come from the asteroid belt. Now we also know some come, there's a small number that come from Mars, there's some that come from the moon, um, but the vast majority clearly come from asteroids. Uh, like asteroids, meteorites come into distinct, distinct flavors or types, and uh, most of the falls we get are things we call ordinary chondrites, and these are these are rocks. They're made of stone, but if you hold one, it's heavy because they have a lot more metal, a lot more iron, often in the form of metal, than a typical rock you'd pick up on the surface of the Earth, because on the Earth, most of the iron is sunk to the core when the Earth differentiated, um, and uh, but most are ordinary chondrites. A small fraction are carbonaceous chondrites, and I'll talk more about those the rest of this talk. There are, there are meteorites that are pure iron and nickel metal, and these, uh, these might be what many people think of when they think of meteorite, because often museums have very large iron meteorites, but they're actually fairly rare in their, their landing. But they're probably from the cores of asteroids that differentiated into metal core and silicate uh, crust, and then got broken up into small pieces by collisions, and now we get bits of cores. And so on, and there's meteorites that are mixtures, and there's achondrites, which are basically volcanic rocks. And a lot of them come from Vesta, but some clearly come from other asteroids as well. The carbonaceous chondrites are particularly interesting um, 
uh, for a number of reasons. One is that they have more carbon and more water than other uh, uh, other types of meteorites. They're, they're called carbonaceous, but they only a few percent carbon, but the carbon's really interesting and that's enough to make them dark and very interesting. But there are very fine grained mixtures of all kinds of stuff. It's kind of just a grab bag of stuff that clearly formed in that disc, came together and very little has happened to them since. The one thing that's happened to many of them is that if there was ice with accreting with them, some of that ice melted from radioactive heating in the early days and reacted with the minerals. So we have clay minerals and things that were not in the disk, but were made on the asteroid. The other reason they're really interesting are these white things you see in there. And these are, these are called calcium aluminum rich inclusions. They're little objects, they're like ceramics, uh, and they are the oldest dated things using radioactive methods of dating rocks. And they, they date to, uh, again, almost 4,600 million years, 4.6 billion years. And, and this is how we define the age of the, the solar system. These, this is time zero. So they're very important for that. So one key question is, can we connect meteorites and asteroids? I said they're both of them have different types. We know where the different asteroid families are. The problem with most meteorites is even the ones that we can trace the fireball is we can't trace them to specific asteroids, at least a priori. And uh, because they've fallen and we don't know where they came from. But of course we'd like to do it because we have tons of data for meteorites and real understanding. And if we could tie particular meteorite classes to meteorite to asteroid classes, we can then know a lot more about those asteroids. So one way to compare, for example, is on the left here by comparing spectra, again, how the light reflects off the rocks. And we find is that there's a class of eight chondrite meteorites called HEDs that have a very good match to Vesta. I, this is actually an old comparison. I think with the Dawn mission, the comparison's better now, but um, this was a telescopic observation of Vesta. Um, but, the, but scientists are pretty uniformly agreed that these meteorites probably come from Vesta. On the right shows one of the interesting science results that came out of the near mission to Eros 20 years ago. And that was that we used, uh, as Rick said, it used x-rays to measure the composition of, of Eros. And what we're looking at here are the magnesium and aluminum uh, composite, uh, amounts of magnesium and aluminum relative to silicon in different types of meteorites. And then the blue circle is where Eros sits. It's a big error bar, but right in the middle of it are the ordinary chondrites. And it had been long suspected that S asteroids are related to ordinary chondrites. And this was very strong evidence for that. So that's one way, but a much better way to, to really do this is to go to the asteroid, grab some dirt and bring it home. And so that's what people have been doing. And there are now three asteroid sample return missions, two of them flown by the Japanese space agency, JAXA, Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2. And uh, NASA has its own mission, uh, that is on its way back to Earth called OSIRIS-REx. And I'm gonna talk about all three, but mostly about Hayabusa 2 because it's the one I'm directly involved in and it's very, very exciting right now. But Hayabusa was the first asteroid sample return. It uh, went to um, a near-Earth asteroid called Itakawa. I did not mention near-Earth asteroids before, but although most asteroids are in the asteroid belt, um, some of them uh, have been perturbed by gravitational interactions with other bodies in the solar system. Or, or collisions and have orbits that now come much closer to the sun and that come near, near Earth's orbit. So these are called near Earth asteroids. And they're of course much easier to get to by spacecraft than going having to fly out way past uh, Mars. So all three of the sample return missions so far and uh, near the near mission have all been to near Earth asteroids. So Itaka was a near Earth asteroid, it's S type. And again, the question was, are these the parent bodies of ordinary chondrite meteorites? And uh, it, it, success, it, it succeeded in going to the surface of the asteroid and taking a sample. The mechanism did not fully work. So there was some question whether any sample would come back with it. And there were also other issues. It was actually a heroic effort, but the spacecraft made it back to earth and dropped the sample. I also wanna point out before I go on though, notice in this asteroid, there's large areas of very smooth material. There's boulders here and there, but there's also large smooth areas. This was also true of Eros and Matilda and other asteroids visited by a spacecraft before Hayabusa 2. That's important. But anyway, here's, uh, they did get it back to Earth. They opened up the sample container and they didn't see anything, but then they basically banged on it and uh, some dust came out and it turned out to be asteroid dust. And this is a, a, a a grain, a, a mineral grain from the surface of asteroid Itakawa. It's about the size, that's about the thickness of a human hair. So this is a very small dust particle, but modern instruments let us do amazing things with very tiny uh, amounts of material. 
And an analysis of this grain and others like it clearly confirmed that uh, S asteroids are connected to ordinary chondrites. This could have come from an ordinary chondrite in terms of its chemical composition and isotopic composition. So it's, uh, um, uh, so the mission was very successful. It, it accomplished its science goal of determining a connection between uh, S asteroids and ordinary chondrites. But then let's go to the to Hayabusa 2. So Hayabusa 2 was chosen and decided to target instead of an S-class asteroid, a C-type asteroid. These, uh, again, are they, they're very dark and thought to possibly be related to carbonaceous chondrites, which again have organics and water and are very primitive and uh, of great, great interest. So they, uh, the space agency uh, picked a near-Earth asteroid called Ryugu. And of course, this is, we didn't know it looked like this until we got there, and I'll get to that in a second. Ryugu is named for a Japanese fairy tale uh, palace for a dragon that's under the sea. Um, anyway, I will talk in more detail about this. But here's a map of, uh, yes, yeah, this also shows Itakawa. So you can see what near-Earth asteroids are. These two asteroids, instead of being in the asteroid belt, their orbits take them between Mars and Earth. So they're both fairly easy to get to by spacecraft. This is what the spacecraft looked like, uh, looks like, it's still out there. Um, and uh, I don't wanna go into all these things, but it, I, I'm gonna talk about many of the things that has cameras and radios, and this whole thing is for sampling, I'll get to that. Uh, instruments to do science and landers and rovers and things, and I'll talk about all of these, um, but it's very cool. This is uh, what it looked like when it was built in the clean room. That's a human being for scale. And so you can see about how big it is. There it is uh, being put into the rocket. And then it was launched in December of 2014. Beautiful launch. And then flew around for two, uh, three years, uh, th two or three years. Yeah, uh, a little over three years. And until it started to approach uh, Ryugu. And there's the first uh, um, view of the spacecraft with its uh, navigation camera, the first view of the spacecraft of Ryugu in February of 2018. So knew they were going the right direction because there's the asteroid right in front of them, but there it's only a pixel or two. But of course, over the next few months, the spacecraft got closer and closer and starting in mid-June could start to resolve its features and immediately saw, wow, that's really interesting. It's kind of shaped like a diamond. Hmm. And as it got closer and closer, so oh, yeah, it's, it's definitely diamond shaped. And there's also obviously big rocks and so on. But anyway, in late June, so about just over three years ago, it made it to Ryugu and to um, started its year and a half of exploring the asteroid. And so these are pictures of two sides of Ryugu. It's about half a mile across, about 870 meters across. Um, it rotates about, it's access about uh, eight hours, so about three times for one of our days. And it's absolutely covered with boulders. You notice there aren't large areas of smooth areas like we saw in Itakawa. So this was immediately seen to be a potential problem uh, for sampling. And I'll get back to that too. For, for reference, uh, I made a plot to show, show its size by showing what it would look like if it was orbiting the Matterhorn instead of the sun. That's about what it would look like in terms of size. And also it's very, very dark. So, uh, my interest is largely in the sample return, but not entirely. And of course, the mission did a lot of great science from the orbit. It, it did mapping with its cameras and its spectrometers over, over the entire asteroid. And I'm going to talk about a couple of orbital science results here. They're able to measure, use the thermal infrared coming off of it and to measure it very, very accurately to determine the temperature across the asteroid as a function of its uh, day and when it's exposed to uh, um, the sun and so on. And from that, able to do modeling of, of the asteroid and its thermal properties clearly indicate that it's very, very porous. This is also evident by its low density. Um, and what this means is it's a so-called rubble pile that, that it's made of rocks kind of loosely joined together with a lot of pore space. And um, this has been hypothesized that most asteroids may be rubble piles, but this was clear evidence that this one is a rubble pile. Most likely it was once part of a much larger object uh, in the asteroid belt. And there was a giant collision that demolished it into small bits that then recreated into, um, into its present space and ended up in its orbit in the nearer, nearer the, the earth. On the right shows the spectra that were taken and the black curve here is, is the spectrum uh, from the visible to the near infrared of, of Ryugu. It's this black curve way down here. And the key thing here is this is the amount of lights reflected. So this thing is dark. It's at 0.02, which means that 98% of the sunlight gets absorbed by the asteroid 
it doesn't reflect back. We only see 2% of the light. So this is like a charcoal briquette. It is a really, really one of the darkest objects in the solar system. It might be the darkest object in the solar system that we've seen. Um, and what you can see is these other asteroids, some of these are other carbonaceous chondrites, many of these are, are dark. They're still only a few percent or up to 10% uh, reflectivity, but they're much brighter than, than Ryugu. The other thing is if we zoom in over here on the right, you see that there's a little dip in its spectrum at 2.7 microns. And this is a clear sign that there are water molecules in silicate minerals. So hydrated minerals like clays uh, uh, um, absorb light at that frequency and at that wavelength. And you can see it in Ryugu, you can see it in carbonaceous chondrites. And, um, and the closest match for this orbital data is a carbonaceous chondrite called Avuna that had been experimentally heated to very high temperatures to 500 degrees C, which basically dehydrated some of the silicates and made this feature smaller. So from the orbital point of view, Ryugu looks like a carbonaceous chondrite, which was kind of the expectation and the hope. But, but what kind of carbonaceous chondrite? We'll get to that. Before we get to that, I want to go through all the fun, wonderful things this mission did, because I just love this mission. Uh, one thing it did was have a couple little tiny rovers that were really an engineering test, but are really cool. And these are about six inches across. They've got little antennas on them and a camera. And they hopped around, and they were dropped uh, to the surface of Ryugu in September of 2018. And these are some pictures they took on their way way down and once they were on the surface. So these are pictures from the surface of an asteroid, the first time anyone's ever had pictures from the surface of an asteroid. A more serious, in terms of science, lander was called Mascot. This was a, a, a lander built by the French and German space agencies. It's about 12 inches across and it's a, a metal box with a few scientific instruments and a battery and uh, some spring mechanisms to allow it to hop if it wants to move. So it's it's a hopper instead of a rover. And it was dropped to the surface of uh, Ryugu when it's say October of 2018. So a few months after we got to the asteroid. And it managed to take, uh, uh, do some thermal measurements that also showed that the rocks at this scale are also porous, not just the global thing, but these ro the rocks themselves appear to have a lot of porosity. And also they had their own, it had its own LED flash bulbs. So it was able to take pictures of the rocks in, at night and get what their real colors are. And this is, this is what the surface of Ryugu looks like. And you zoom in and it's very dark and has little bright spots of different colors. Well, you compare that, this is a carbonaceous chondrite. They look pretty darn similar to that meteorite. And it's just the colors and visible, you know, what it looks like, but this is further evidence that, wow, yeah. Ryugu might look like a carbonaceous chondrite. But of course, we can tell because we have sample returns. So what about the sample return from this mission? And uh, this is a movie that JAXA made to show how it works. So the basic mechanism is it's, it's going to do it fast and then it'll do it slow. Is that it comes down to the surface. And when it gets down there, it fires a projectile into the surface of the asteroid, which knocks material back up the horn that flies up into the sample container and gets put into uh, sample return capsules and then flies away. And so that was the idea. But if you noticed in that, the, the cartoon, this, this visualization, it was a nice, flat, smooth area. Not so on Ryugu. So a big problem was trying to figure out where to land. And there was a very important meeting in August of 2018 in Japan. Um, and there were a large number of scientists and engineers that discussing this. The engineers had found a number of places they thought were safe, and we had to discuss various things we knew about those sites and make a decision, and eventually decided on a site called L08, and it had relatively few boulders, and but it was going to be a tight fit. It was the spacecraft was designed to have a larger, larger margin of error for landing. So spent months and months of rehearsing in the fall of 2018 in order to uh, make sure they knew what they were doing, and the actual collection, the actual sample collection is completely autonomous. So there's no room for error. So you have to make sure you know what you're doing. But in February 21st, the mission managers decided we were ready and decided to send the spacecraft down. So this was shortly before it went down. And I love picture, I just love photos of spacecraft on other planets. It's awesome. Um, anyway, uh, this is it very close to its landing site and uh, as it's coming down and this is a movie of the landing. Uh, let me know, this was taken by a camera that was on the outside designed for this purpose. Let me know or see if you can figure out uh, when, when it actually fires the pellet into the surface of the asteroid. It's getting closer and closer. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
There you go. <laughs> it's pretty obvious something bad happened to the surface of the asteroid there. And you can see all these millions of particles that were flown up. Uh, and scientists are now analyzing every single one of these images, getting the shapes of the particles, uh, and using them to determine things about the material properties of the surface. But it seemed to be very, very successful. There was great confidence that sample was collected. Then, that was one touchdown, but that wasn't the end of the mission. They also uh, designed this mission with an astonishingly cool experiment called the Small Carry-On Impactor. And this, basically the spacecraft got went close to the asteroid and threw a ball of copper at it and then ran away to the other side of the asteroid so it wouldn't get hit by any debris. But on its way around, it dropped off a camera, a free floating little camera to sit in space and take pictures from the side. And those pictures took it as this copper ball hit the surface It made an impact crater. And these are probably the only images in existence of a crater being formed on, a, on another planet, Terry body. I just, I just love this. So this was in April. It worked, <clears throat> obviously you can see there, and this is before and after this area. I, you may be able to see here on the right that this right around here next to these boulders, it, there's a new crater in a little pit that's dark. So it's, it's, you know, it's a few meters across. It's not, it's not huge. But the decision was made to do another touchdown and sample collection from right around here to uh, in the hope that we could collect material that had been buried. So the first sample was definitely from the top surface. The hope is that this sample comes from below the surface so we can compare material directly exposed to outer space and material that's protected by rocks on top of it. And that was successful. Well, was the, the collection was successful in July of 2019. So then the spacecraft, they spent a few more months at, the, at Ryugu doing more observations, uh, but at the end of, in November of 2019, left Ryugu to come back to Earth for sample return. And late last year, sample return occurred. Um, <clears throat> the basic idea is that TCM means trajectory correction maneuver. It basically means the spacecraft fired its engines to change its direction a little bit. And all of this was in the months before December uh, to get it so it's at the exact right spot. So when it lets go of the sample return capsule right here, the sample return capsule will keep moving in the right direction so that it comes through the atmosphere and lands in a particular spot in Australia. Shortly after it did that, the spacecraft did another burn so that it would not also crash into Australia and would come over here and escape the Earth. And uh, and this, the, as I'll show in a second, that this was completely successful. The sample cabinister came back successfully. But before I go on, I want to mention the spacecraft kept going and JAXA, the Japanese government has approved an extended mission. And it's now planning to go to two more bodies, very, two very small, very, very fast spinning asteroids with these kind of um, uninspiring names uh, in 2026 and 2031. So this mission is nowhere near being done. It's, it's got years still to go with the spacecraft. But in the meantime, the samples came back, and this is the fireball as the space as the capsule was coming through the atmosphere. And this was I just took and from the live feed on my computer, just filmed it on my phone because it was just so awesome to watch. And uh, it was night in Australia. Here's another fireball, but early in the morning when the sun came up, it was very easy to find it. You can see there's the sample return capsule on its on its parachute, and it was very quickly collected and brought to a field lab for some field tests and then brought back to Japan. And put in this thing. <laughs> this is a giant uh, vacuum chamber that JAXA has built for the curation facility of the Hayabusa 2 samples. And it's designed to basically be able to take the samples out of the sample collector and manipulate them and do some basic characterization, some spectroscopy and some measurements completely under vacuum so that they're protected from any interaction with the Earth's atmosphere or anything. So it's keeping them as dry as possible, as long as possible before they get, I mean, at some point they have to come out to be given to scientists to do, to do research. But this is the plan right now. And it's a very, very cool instrument. And very shortly after they got to Japan, they pulled them out of the collector and uh, released this picture. And these, this is the sample. This is Ryugu up very, very close. Uh, that's a five micro or five millimeters. So this thing's about, these are little canisters about an inch across. It collected five and a half grams of Ryugu. That doesn't sound like much, right? That's a quarter of an ounce or less than a quarter of an ounce, but it's, uh, um, but with modern technology, you can do a tremendous amount with this much material. And so it's very, very exciting. The science, the mission goal was for 100 or 150 milligrams. So we got far more than that. 
you can see the two collections look different. This is the one from the artificial crater. This was the first one and there's a different grain size. There's somewhat bigger grains here, but they're all very, very black and shiny and there's some stuff in there. Um, and that's what we're hoping to find out what it is. Just for comparison, this is a similar amount of a carbonaceous chondrite called Tarda that we just obtained in our lab. Uh, this was a meteorite that fell in Morocco a year or two ago. It's an interesting carbonaceous chondrite. And I just, I pulled it out of the package when we received it and it just looked so much like the Ryugu samples. I had to make a picture at the same scale. So again, everything about this is screaming, this is like carbonaceous chondrites. But is it? Well, what's the plan? Now that the samples are back. Since January, the curation team has been working feverishly to do basic characterization to make a catalog and provide samples and get them ready to provide to the science team that's going to do preliminary examination starting today and or tomorrow and or in the last couple of weeks, really. Um, and I found out this afternoon that the first paper from the curation team has been submitted and has been placed online on a preprint server. So as of a few hours ago, I see, I've seen the first results that can be made public uh, about Ryugu, the Ryugu samples other than that picture. And there's not very much in there. There's some things about the density, the, the particles are low density um, and they're very dark, but the spectra are quite interesting for a couple of reasons. One, so these are the, the near infrared spectrum around 2.7 microns, uh, again, for the two collections. And you see this feature at 2.7, which again is from like hydrated minerals. And when you compare it to the orbital spectrum of Ryugu, it confirms what the orbital spectrum did. But what you wanna see here is these are the error bars on the Ryugu spectrum. It's very hard to measure things from space and from an orbiting spacecraft and much, much easier in the laboratory. And so the, um, this is just an argument for sample return, why sample return is so wonderful because we build these fantastic instruments in the lab that we could never fly on a spacecraft. So having both the spacecraft data and the sample return is important. And it's very, very clear that, that, that the Ryugu samples have hydrated silicates. There's also a feature here at 3.4 microns that is due to either organic matter or carbonate minerals, things like you know, calcium carbonate, it's antacid pills or chalk. Uh, uh, and it's, it could very well could be both, both, but we don't know yet. Um, so from here on out, that's what they've been doing. They just reported that. The preliminary examination starts now and lasts for the next year. And the, there are seven science teams led by uh, seven science, Japanese scientists to cover various aspects of the scientific investigations. Uh, various members of our department are members of either the chemistry and or the insoluble organics team. The, inso the organic, that inso organics team is led by Hikaru Yabuta, who is a former postdoc from the Earth and Planets Laboratory. And she's doing a spectacular job of leading this team. And uh, we actually expect our first samples to analyze uh, in the department by the end of the July. So I'm extremely excited about this, but I obviously can't show any results. Two nights ago, I had the best Zoom meeting of the last year, which was that the chemistry team decided to live stream the first look at the first sample they got. And so this was uh, live from Hokkaido, Japan, put a sample in the electron microscope and had took pictures of it and moved around looking at it. Unfortunately, I have to black it out because this is not public information yet. So uh, you're going to have to wait with bated breath to see when the results are finally, finally released. But I will say I'm very excited and it's very interesting. So before I get to the science uh, I wanna cover uh, or th that we're gonna do with this now that we're getting the samples, um, I want to talk a little bit about NASA's mission. It's very similar in many ways. It, um, it went to another near-Earth asteroid called Bennu. It's about half the size of Ryugu. And guess what? It's a diamond and it's completely covered with boulders, just like Ryugu. And just like Hayabusa 2, OSIRIS-REx is a mission that was designed with the idea that there would be nice flat areas to sample. So it took the mission team a lot of work to figure out to, to convince themselves and rewrite software and develop methods to do it in a more dangerous way. But they were able to last October, they had a successful collection. And this is, uh, this is the actual footage. And again, I think you'll be able to see when it makes contact with the surface of the asteroid. And this mission collected so much material that when they looked at the sample canister, it was losing material and there was bits blocking the door and all this stuff. So they stowed it away to bring it back to Earth. But this, this uh, osiris Rex is going to bring back a much larger sample than Hayabusa 2 did. So there's going to be lots of asteroidal material for scientists to play with for many years to come. It's on its way back to Earth. It less, left uh, Bennu a couple months ago and uh, the samples are expected to arrive in 2023. So we got to keep our eyes on that. So what do we hope to learn from these samples from Ryugu and Bennu? 
And there's a lot, of course, and I'm not going to go into all the questions. I'm going to just go into a few things, especially things I'm interested in. But the number one question is, or at least the first question to ask, because we know so much about meteorites, is Ryugu, is Bennu related to known carbonaceous chondrites? What I've got here is the very sort of busy um, classification scheme for chondrite meteorites. And there's actually four different groups of chondrites. And the carbonaceous groups have eight different subtypes and there's additional carbonaceous chondrites that don't fit in any of these. So there's multiple, you know, each one of these may represent one asteroid or many asteroids. And the question is, is Ryugu related to one of these or similar or different? And how is it similar or different? Do they have the same minerals? Are the minerals the same composition? Are there minerals we don't see in other carbonaceous chondrites? Can we use radioactive methods to measure the ages of these different minerals and these different components and how do they compare to other meteorites and what does that tell us uh, about the early solar system and compositions. And very importantly, whether there's different, where there are differences with meteorites, even if it's the same class, well, if they're different classes, it helps us better understand the range of compositions in the solar system. But even if it turns out it's related to known meteorites, by comparing the meteorites to the asteroids, we can find out what happens to this material when it comes to Earth. So you have to remember the meteorites, between being in space and being in our laboratories, fly through the atmosphere, get heated so high you see this giant fireball, though that heating is really on the outside, but they can interact with the Earth's atmosphere. And then they land and they may be collected right away or maybe sit for a long time and time for bacteria to crawl in and start eating stuff or for water to seep in and alter things. And we don't fully know, we, we know what many of those effects are, but by having a sample that's been kept dry and perfect from the time of its collection will really allow us to better understand what happens to meteorites before they fall. And that will help us better understand asteroids so we know what properties are really Earth properties and what are from the asteroids. Another really, really big question driving both the Ryugu and the Bennu uh, sample analysis is organics. As I mentioned earlier, carbonaceous chondrites have organics in them and they're potentially, uh, potentially very important as sort of providing the seed materials for the emergence of life on Earth. So, and, and they contain things like amino acids. And so this plot here on the left is from Danny Glavin at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center who's done a lot of really nice analysis of different types of amino acids and different types of meteorites. And you can see it varies from meteorite to meteorite. And some of that is due to this interaction with water as the asteroid heats and, and processes, but some of it may be primordial. And we need, we need to understand all of that to understand what is delivered to the earth. So does Ryugu look like one of these or is it different? We also see lots of, most of the organics in meteorites, in fact, are not amino acids and stuff like that. It's actually this very complex tar kind of coal-like black stuff. And uh, that's very, very interesting in its own right. And it's possible the amino acids are made by processing of this material. Um, but one of the things we've known for some time is that it's isotopically crazy. So um, what's plotted here is essentially the amount of deuterium in this organic matter. This is a little tiny chunk of organic matter from a meteorite. And uh, deuterium is a heavy form of hydrogen, and it's on Earth, you know, maybe one in 20,000 hydrogen atoms is a deuterium. But where you see these yellow spots, it's actually like 25 times higher than that. And the only place you can get that kind of composition is at really, really, really low temperatures where you have strange chemistry going on. So the organics, some of these organics may have formed in the interstellar medium in molecular clouds that are only a few degrees above absolute zero or in the very, very outer reaches of the solar system and then got pulled into the inner solar system. We don't know, but understanding how Ryugu and Bennu relate to what we know about organics and meteorites will really help us better understand the whole history of carbon in the solar system and its role on, on Earth. Um, another thing, and uh, Rick mentioned these in passing, one of my great loves are things called pre-solar grains. These are dust grains that are older than the solar system and we find them in, in meteorites. And uh, we know they're pre-solar because they have very unusual isotopes. And if, if you don't know what this quantity is, it doesn't matter. The key thing is that everything that formed in the solar system fits in this red line. And these tiny microscopic crystals of silicon carbide, this grains one millionth of a meter across or a few millionths of a meter across have a very different value. And that value for this ratio means that it formed in a star, something like this. This is a planetary nebula. That's what the sun is gonna look like in about 5 billion years when it ends its life and its atmosphere gets blown off into and makes dust. And that's what we think. We think this grain and all these grains formed in previous generations of suns that made dust. But they're really, they're in meteorites, but they're in different amounts of 
in different amounts and different types of meteorites. So knowing what kinds are in the Ryugu and Bennu samples will really tell us, again, something about early solar system processes and how this material gets processed in the disk and survives under various conditions. And so it's an extremely important question is whether we find pre-solar grains in these samples and how many we find and what types. Another issue that many people are going to be addressing on these samples is the question of space weathering. And space weathering is the kind of fanciful term uh, 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 given to the effects of uh, the space environment on airless bodies. And space is a profoundly radioactive place. There, the, there's high energy particles streaming out of the sun all the time. It's called the solar wind. When they interact with the Earth's, with the Earth's magnetic field at the poles, you get ionization in the atmosphere and that makes the Northern Lights. If you have a storm, it can destroy our satellites and so on. But if these atoms, uh, if these high energy particles hit uh, uh, the surface of an asteroid, they can alter the surface. They, they interact chemically and physically with the material. And so this is this is an example of uh, a particle from Itakawa, from Hayabusa. And this is an incredibly small scale. This is, our, this is an image with the, taken with a transmission electron microscope. And this is 20 nanometers. So this thing's 100 nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So this is very, very small. And But it's affecting that surface. It's taking the iron out of the silicate and making little balls of iron metal with it. And this has important effects on how the light reflects on the spectra of these things. So it's important to understand these effects so we can interpret uh, telescopic observations. And we don't know what it does to see asteroids. There's some really nice experimental work where people shine lasers on sea chondrites and see what happens, but we'll, we now have a direct sample. These samples were hit by the solar wind. What happened to them? So we'll be looking at that. But really the question we wanna answer is, this is the big one. And that's what all of these weigh into is how do you go from this big pancake of gas and dust to an orderly set of planets and a few crumbs of leftovers. And we won't answer that question, but we will answer some of these questions. And we'll, and of course the samples will surprise us in many ways and give us uh, um, new puzzles and new questions to ask. And that's how science works and why I love science. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about. Before I stop, I do want to mention, I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a million asteroids known. Most of them are given very unimaginative names, but the International Astronomical Union is very, um, willing to let discoverers of asteroids give them names and our most names are allowed. And in the last few decades, uh, some scientific societies have been going to the effort of naming asteroids for scientists who work on asteroids or have contributed to our knowledge of planetary science and asteroids. And when I went to look at this last week, I discovered a fair number of my colleagues at, uh, and former colleagues at the Earth and Planetary Lab have had been honored with this, uh, having an asteroid named for them. So I feel very honored to be in with this August co uh, collection of, of current and former EPL folks, um, astronomers and planetary scientists. And um, uh, this is their orbits uh, of each one of these asteroids that are named for us. And the number, so 5992 Nittler means it is the 5,992nd asteroid discovered. And the green spot is where these asteroids are right now, basically. So I thought this was a fun way to do tribute to my wonderful colleagues at EPL and the wonderful science we get to be involved with. And I want to say thank you. This is a picture of the control room at uh, one of the mission successes of Hibusa 2. And I just want to add, use this to acknowledge the incredible work of JAXA and the, the, the main science team and engineering team and navigation teams of JAXA. I'm just blown away at the capabilities and dedication of these people to make such an incredible mission happen. And it's just extremely successful. And I'm so proud to be part of it and happy to be part of it. And I'm gonna stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> we got lots of virtual uh, <laughs> going on there. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of questions. So uh, let me read some of them to you. The by far the uh, most abundant question is about uh, uh, the shape of Ryugu and Bennu. Why do they have the same shape? And what does the diamond shape tell you about the, the history of these asteroids? I, I should have included a slide to that. It is actually comes out of some of the dynamic simulations of these rubble pile formation that when they do computer simulations of smashing it open, smashing it into pieces and it re-accreting these small bodies, it, there's angular momentum that's spinning and it tends to lead to this kind of shape. So it, it turns out it's probably not uncommon for small rubble pile asteroids. <laughs> Thanks Larry, let's uh, go, go way back to the uh, origin of these planetary systems in the, in the first place. And here's a question is, uh, 
I get how the dust could collapse and form stars and planets, but why does the disk rotate? The, the, the reason it forms a disk and why it rotates is because uh, there was some angular momentum in the system to begin with. And physics declares that angular momentum is conserved. So it's the same thing like a figure skater spinning and speeding up or you know, based on how they move their arms. If you're spinning, you keep spinning if there's no friction to stop you. And so there's a little bit of spinning going on in the cloud. And as it collapses, it gets faster and faster and noticeable. And just the physics works that it makes it into this pancake and it spins and everything rotates. I High school know. physics, it turns out. <laughs> at, at a very large scale. At a very large scale. <laughs> uh, here's a question. Uh, we call it the asteroid belt. What is the probability that that was once a planet that was blasted to smithers by a collision by another body? Uh, the, the chance of that is nil because if it had been a planet that large enough to do that, it would have differentiated like the Earth and it wouldn't look have these cape, these uh, properties of being really primitive and having a composition like the sun and these fine grained things. It would look more like the meteorites from Vesta. It would look like volcanic rocks or chunks of metal. And they, some of them are like that, but the vast majority are not. Uh, here's one. How were the uh, two asteroids, uh, meaning Ryugu and Bennu, chosen for a visit? So uh, I wasn't involved in either de decision, but I can say that it almost certainly was, they knew they wanted to visit a C-type asteroid, and it had to be a near-Earth asteroid, and they looked at all of the known ones and figured out which ones were easiest to get to on the time scale of the mission. So they have to do all the celestial dynamic calculations to say, if we launch in 2014, which ones could we get to? And found that these were the best choices for the two missions. Here's, here's an interesting one, an intriguing question is, uh, if these things are so dark, how are the extremely dark asteroids detected in the first place? Because the sun is very, very bright. So if you, even if you reflect, only reflect 2% of the sun's light, it's still a lot of light. <laughs> and they're near earth. So they're, they're closer to us. So it would, I don't, it would be much harder to find a body as small as Ryugu, as dark as Ryugu, if it was say out at, uh, near Jupiter because it's so small and so dark. But because it's closer to the sun, it's brighter. And because it's closer to us, it looks brighter to us. <laughs> Sounds good. Here's uh, what are the potential implications of this direct sampling technology for the future of asteroid mining? I have no idea. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good question, but asteroid mining is a subject of which I am 100% ignorant. And I don't know if uh, these kind of technologies are being considered. I would imagine probably not because these technologies are designed to quickly go down and grab a little. And I think mining would be to put something more permanent that would pull more up, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, what do we know about Ryugu's internal structure? Is it possible that it has much more fine-grained material inside of it? Yes, I, I should have mentioned that. So the fact that it has so that we know it's very porous and has low density, and so we think the fact that it has so many boulders on the surface most likely means that the fine-grained stuff has fallen in the cracks and is is inside. We don't know that, but it seems. Uh, it seems quite plausible to explain why it's missing more fine grained material because it has craters. So things hit it and that makes fine grained material, but it's not there. <laughs> uh, here's, here's, these are all good questions. These are all great questions. Yeah. Uh, so here's one uh, actually coming from a Japanese attendee. Uh, is how does the variation of color of carbonaceous chondrites or C-type asteroids occur? Is it related to alteration by water or heat? And why is Ryugu black? I hope we find the answer to that question in the next six months. Uh, you know, one thought was that it might be have more carbon. Carbon is very, very dark. If this if this asteroid has more carbon than other carbonaceous chondrites, then that could explain it. But other minerals like sulfides are also dark, and um, so we don't actually um, we don't know, but we should know soon why why they're different brightnesses. And of course, space weathering may play a role as well, that the surface brightness is certainly gonna be affected by how it interacts with radiation. So these are all questions we, that's, those are excellent questions and they're things that people want to answer with the samples. Here's a technical question about how the missions are done. Uh, are the spacecraft pre-programmed pre to fly towards the asteroid that they're trying to study? And how do people control its trajectory on its flight? But is it necessary to communicate with it or does it just fly 
and then return all on its own. It's it's interactive. There's there's no way you could pre-program it. So uh, you have a, you have a plan in advance, but you have the ability to continuously communicate with the spacecraft by radio. You can upload new software. You can you know uh, interact with it all the time, and you have to. So you you often if these missions, you you launch. So you can get close to where you want to be, but then you plan on having these engine burns now and then to fix your orbit so you get closer and closer. Space is really, really big, and these things are really, really small. There's no way you could perfectly program it in advance. It's an excellent question, but uh, we're nowhere near the technological level where we couldn't, where we could do it without interaction. Here's a very intriguing question: is is, is when 96% of sunlight is absorbed by the asteroid? What happens to the absorbed light and does it make chemical changes? That's a good question. <laughs> it, I mean, yeah, it heats it. And that's what, and so I showed you the temperature map. The, the, the surface is actually quite warm and because it's absorbing this heat. It's not so warm that it's going to melt or anything, but it could affect things like organic matter and hydrated silicates. And maybe that's why this feature is smaller. It's, it might just be heating, this heating from absorbing the sunlight that has driven away some of the, the water-based silicates just from the very surface, which is what's making the reflection. So, and the short answer is it heats it, whether it has, what effect that has, we don't know. <laughs> I think it's important to, uh, you mentioned this a bit, Larry, but it's important to remember that uh, all of these surface features are basically burned off when asteroids come through and become meteorites, right? So, so yeah. being able to go and collect this is, is a great way to, to address questions like that. Yes. Um, here, here's one that, uh, you don't. You may or may not know the answer to is. Did the minute contact the spacecraft had with the asteroid change their orbits in any small way? Well, by the laws of physics, it had to have changed it in some small way. But my guess is an incredibly small way. I, I, doubt, I doubt it's detectable. <laughs> and especially, especially the um, Hayabusa two that did not actually touch the surface. It got close to the surface and fired a pellet. <laughs> So here, here's one that gets back to your uh, interstellar dust buster expertise. <laughs> uh, what is the chemical composition of dust particles in a cloud? Uh, from astronomical observations, they seem to be a mixture of silicates and mostly amorphous silicates, so sort of glassy little things, and carbon, little carbonaceous uh, grains. And uh, But those astronomical observations are looking at the average composition over a huge, a huge amount of material. And... Uh, so another uh, another mission idea I've been involved with and others have too is the idea of possibly uh, trying to collect a lot of interstellar dust coming into the solar system and bring it back to our sample return. Uh, it turns out as the solar system is moving through the galaxy, it's encountering the interstellar medium. And so there's dust particles coming through and from, from these kinds of places. And if we could uh, collect them and analyze them in the lab, we could answer that question. And we have a few of those particles that were collected by the Stardust mission. And the answer is that they're all different. So <laughs> it's a very, very good question and of great interest to me and many others. Let's just take a couple more. We're a bit over time, Larry, but there's some really intriguing questions here. So here, here's one is given the asteroid belt is not static, how is it evolving? How is it evolving? How is it evolving? Yeah. How is it changing with time, right? Um, that would be a question for some of my dynamicist colleagues, I think. But I mean, basically everything in the solar system by gravity tugs on everything else. But, you know, Earth gra tugging on Jup Jupiter doesn't do anything. And all the planets are in very stable orbits for now. But these small bodies, they, as they move around, they can, in, they can basically get pulled on by the sun and by Jupiter and by Saturn in such a way that it can change their orbits. And this is why a large reason why we end up with meteorites is that these bodies get shifted a little and then they hit to a particular spot where the, the interaction of the gravity drives it into the inner solar system. And so what's happening is it's evolving in that the material is moving around and changing orbits and some of it gets flung in, some of it gets flung out. And there's computer models that can do all this, but I don't know any details beyond that level of answer. <laughs> uh, here, here's a, an interesting question that proposes an event that hopefully won't happen, uh, but I think it'll make a good point about uh, why why we study these meteorites and what they tell us about the composition of solar systems. So the question is, if we cool the sun to make it a solid phase, what kind of meteorite or asteroid would the sun most resemble? A comet. <laughs> uh, 
um, though there's not enough oxygen really. So um, uh, maybe I should say, I mean, you couldn't cool it completely solid to be look like anything because hydrogen and helium are mostly gaseous, right? So Jupiter has a huge envelope uh, atmosphere of helium and hydrogen, and we don't have a solid hydrogen envelope anywhere, but, but maybe the center of Jupiter would be the answer. The core of Jupiter would be what it would be most like, <laughs> uh, which might have solid hydrogen. <laughs> let's end with this one, Larry. This, I, I like these questions about how you, how you got interested in the field. This one's very well stated. So it says, uh, when you were a kid and first became interested in space stuff, did you and your wildest dreams imagine you'd be parts of missions like this? And was there someone who inspired you to imagine bigger than you thought possible? Those are excellent questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't imagine I'd be part of an asteroid sample return mission, but I will say that I was, um, I don't know, around seven or eight years old when Viking, uh, the Viking landers went to Mars. And I have this vivid memory of the National Geographic. My parents subscribed to National Geographic and with these Mars pictures on the cover. And, and then Voyager happened around the same time and went to Jupiter and Saturn. And I cut out all of those pictures of planets and I hung them on my wall. And I knew then I wanted to, I wanted to do space stuff. And then the person who had the outsized influence on me was Carl Sagan and his Cosmos television program. I was the age uh, what that was perfect for. And, it really gave me the bug for space science and science in general. And, uh, and there we are. <laughs> it, it's funny that you mentioned the Viking is it occurred when I was in high school and I applied to be a summer intern for it and did ex almost exact, I didn't get selected unfortunately, but, but they uh, were nice enough to send me all the, all the brochures that came out and uh, I cut all the pictures out and had them hanging on my wall, just like you said. <laughs> <laughs> missions have inspired a lot of planetary science. So. Yes. <laughs> so Larry, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and thank you all for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, we will be returning again with the neighborhood lectures in, in September uh, with the hope that we're actually going to have uh, them in person. They will be streamed as well. So they will uh, remain a virtual component. But if COVID cooperates, uh, we hope to be able to welcome you back to our beautiful campus in September. So once again, thank you, Larry. Uh, and thank you all for attending tonight. Yes, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>